I think it's time. Let's uh, have uh, have our expert join us. There he is, Dave. It worked. You're there. Nice to see you. Can you hear uh, me now? We can hear you just fine. Oh, that's good. So, uh, so I hope you liked all the references to your previous work. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, do tell us uh, what in the world is happening. What can we expect out of Comet Atlas? Uh, what does it mean? Are we all going to mm -hmm. die? Yeah, no, nobody knows what it means. That's that's the whole thing. Um, so the fact that it brightened very quickly, uh, as uh, was just explained, is very interesting to a lot of people and very exciting because maybe it's going to be really, really bright when it comes to perihelion. But actually, we know that oftentimes when you see a comet that brightens very rapidly as it comes towards the sun, it's because it's falling apart. <laughs> so that is exactly the case with Atlas. It, I mean, it has fallen apart already. So its perihelion distance is quarter of an AU, so a quarter of the a quarter of the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And that's pretty close. So the hope was, you know, hey, if it's bright at two AUs from the Sun and it's bright at one and a half AUs, it must be really bright at a quarter of an AU. But that is now totally collapsed because it, it literally fell to bits. And to answer the question, I did look it up. It's the period is 6,000 years. <laughs> I didn't know that. So um, what, what's happening is it's gone from, you know, the, the, the next comet of the century, so to speak, and we have many, many comets every, every century that get that label because people are always thinking this is going to be the big one, it's going to be great, and then they fail, um, to being very interesting because it broke up. And so it offers us um, the chance to find out something about the breakup uh, mechanism and, and just to look and see what's happening. And then maybe if we're lucky, we can figure out something about the, the nature of comets by looking at this kind of an event. So that's why that's what I, I hope to get out of it. You know, it would have been nice to see it blazing across the sky, casting shadows and be able to smell the gas as it as it, <laughs> as it passed the earth, but it's not gonna happen. Now, um, three weeks ago, I asked you to join us um, and uh, before it really fell apart and you said, oh, I've got Hubble data coming yeah. up time. How is it that Hubble's able to just quickly go, um, you know, uh, and point at this telescope? Well, how, how did quick. you get I mean, Hubble time in no time flat when this is well, happening? Well, you have to write a proposal in no time flat. So I wrote a proposal uh, and and then the good people of Space Telescope were kind enough to, to allocate some uh, time, just two orbits to this thing. Um, HST is intrinsically not very fast. So you, you know, it's a it's a thing in space. They don't want to mess with it. They don't want to screw anything up. So they're very cautious with uploading new pointing positions. Everything is very very carefully controlled by a whole team of experts. Um, and I think in the end it was two weeks or two and a half weeks or something to get the the observation, which is fast for HST, but it's not like you know your telescope in 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 the backyard. You just go and point at it. <laughs> uh, that's much in a way much better in terms of being able to get a quick look at something. So HST is this is this very, very special instrument, but it's, it's not a very speedy instrument in terms of looking at a new thing. So anyway, I, I feel happy about that. Um, there's another team led by uh, Quan Ji Ye from University of Maryland who also uh, had, had time to look at this comet. So together we had three orbits of space telescope to look at uh, Comet Atlas. And maybe Rich, you should see it. I think you have some pictures, yes. I'm gonna to try to make them visible with this zoom share screen thing. So hold on. And while you're holding on, any can you guys hear the screaming and banging up? I don't have the door open, but no. oh, okay. Not yet. Quite loud here. <laughs> no. Can you see that or not? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So um we had basically um, observations with Hubble on two days, the 20th of April and the 23rd of April. <clears throat> so the top and the bottom pictures. And you can see what we'd already seen from the ground, but a much higher resolution. So from the ground uh, in pictures that you can find on the web, these, um, these little subnuclei are kind of blended, for the most part, blended together. And then the very faint ones, which even on this picture, I must say are hard to, hard to see on my computer screen, 
uh, are just not visible at all from the ground. So in that top picture from the 20th of April, I counted um, over 30 individual fragments of uh, what used to be Comet Atlas. Now, now it's Comet Atlases, I guess. <laughs> uh, and maybe um, on the 23rd, there, there are a couple dozen that I could, could see without trying too hard. So we know that the comet has fragmented. And we also see that what we've seen before, that the, the fragments are embedded in this kind of diffuse halo of dust. Uh, and what that consists of is all the particles that are, are there contributing to the scattered light. They're just reflecting sunlight back to us, uh, but they're individually too small to see as points. But there's like thousands and millions of them. So we see this big dust sheet that was ejected from the original body when it broke up. And then we see that each of the little subunits looks like a mini comet. It's got its own little tail pointing up there to about you know the 930 position, um, just like an independent comet, which it is. So in a sense, it's a picture of, in the top, a picture of 30 comets that have a common recent origin, but now there are 30 independent things going around the sun. And they're moving apart. Um, speed is, is, is on the order of you know, a meter per second, very, very small. So walking speed or a little slower than walking speed, they're separating, uh, but very, very gentle. It's not like a powerful energetic explosion, dynamite explosion. It's a, it's a very gentle separation of these uh, pieces, which is probably a clue to the mechanism behind the breakup of this thing. So that's roughly what we see. Um, I mean, a, a good question, uh, that could be asked is how, how big was this thing before it broke up? And the sad answer is we don't really know, but a guess would be a few hundred meters, something like that. So it's almost certainly not a very big object, probably not bigger than a kilometer, I'm guessing 300 meters, something like that. Um, and, and now it's divided up into a whole bunch of smaller pieces, which are themselves continuing to disintegrate. So I guess the last thing, I don't want to talk too much about that, but the last thing I would say is if you compare the top picture and the bottom one, it actually turns out to be quite difficult to know, you know, wh which piece is which. It's quite difficult to connect the dots between those, those two pictures. Um, and frankly, I, I have not myself succeeded in connecting many of the dots uh, in this. So I think that means that the individual pieces are turning on and turning off. And so if you could do a movie, that'd be really nice, but if you could take a movie of this thing, it would look like lights flashing on a Christmas tree, all separating at the same time as this thing um, is, is swinging around the sun. So it's still a while. Uh, NASA did string together some of these ish, uh, images. And well, no, they, they, they did a kind of a cute thing. They, they blended those two pictures, that's all. There's, there's no there's no more information than those two pictures. Oh, so those are the only two? It looked like more, but it made it look like it was quite the flashy. Oh, no, they're good at that. It's like JPL is good at doing things like that too, but they, they just blended the two pictures to simulate something that looks half believable. But actually it's it's only those two pictures that we have. Um, yeah. So per, perihelion is um, on May the 31st, again, at a quarter of an AU. Um, it will then be pretty close to the sun. So space telescope can no longer look at it because it's already too close to the sun in the sky. So basically it's all over as far as these high resolution pictures are concerned. Um, amateur astronomers and, and brave astronomers with, with big telescopes, uh, if they were not shut down by coronavirus, could also look uh, at it. Uh, but my guess is we, we've seen the last of it for the most part. My guess is that we won't see it after perihelion uh, both because it'll be too faint, it'll be fragmented into tiny pieces, and also because we won't know where it is, because our ability to predict the position that far in the future, it doesn't come out of the sun for space telescope until September. Um, we, we just won't know where to point. So I think that's it for HST on Comet Atlas. Yeah, well, uh, sorry we won't get the nice show, but at least... Uh... We can not have a lot of uh, doomsday yeah. crazy talk on on uh, you know on what the comet means and 
Although I'm going to just say, Dave, I'm going to out you here. <laughs> I believe you did say to me that you thought the comet brought the, uh, you know, like like the Andromeda strain. It, it brought this. Coronavirus. So. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's this comet or Borisov. One of those two brought, <laughs> almost certainly one of those two brought the virus to the earth. And we're suffering the consequence right now. There's some good science fiction in that if you good have. Good luck to all those conspiracy theorists yeah. out there. So would you like me to talk just very briefly about the, the meaning of breakup or not? Uh, you know, actually, before we do that, can oh. we um, take, uh, Brendan, yep. you have questions. We've had several questions come in. Any that are pertain to the things that um, Dave has been talking about? We do, yes. Um, one of the questions uh, is from Alex, uh, and he asks, uh, let me make sure I have it up. Uh, why doesn't the comet get caught in the sun's gravitational pull and remain in orbit around it? So probably specifically referring to uh, to trans solar system uh, comets. So the, like Borisov or Oumuamua. Yes. So the, the answer, good question. The answer is they're just going too fast. So there's a maximum speed over which the sun can exert control on an object. It's, it's called the escape speed, the gravitational escape speed. And actually that's how we know that these bodies are not from the solar system, they're just traveling faster than the gravitational escape speed from the sun. So si simply the sun doesn't have enough mass and enough gravity to, to hold them back. Great. So yeah, go ahead and share with the others about the breakup, your other slides there. So I just very, very put, quickly put this together, uh, just something to talk about. Um, I mean, the first question really is who cares, right? <laughs> I mean, astronomers care, um, um, they're, they're nice, they're pretty to look at, smashed up comets are kind of cool, but scientifically, who cares? Well, it matters actually, because we don't know um, how comets are ultimately destroyed. So you mentioned earlier on, we know where they come from. They come from the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud, and they fall into the vicinity, vicinity of the planets. Um, but, but we know that they don't seem to last when they're in the vicinity of the planets. So if they, if they were just point sources like asteroids, they were not losing material, they would be able to survive for half a million years on the average. So 500,000 years, a pretty long time. But when we look at the comets, we don't see enough comets um, in the vicinity of the planets to, to have lived for that long. So if we, in other words, if we collected comets for half a million years, we would have a lot more than the number we see. So we think that they live for maybe 10,000 or 20,000 years once they're in the inner solar system. And in the old days, which means like 10 years ago, people thought, well, that's because they come in, they're, they're covered in ice, and then that ice is all boiled away. It's all vaporized. And then after that, there's, nothing, there's no icy thing, so it doesn't look like a comet. It just looks like an asteroid. But we actually don't see a large number of dead comets either. People are working all the time to find dead comets, um, but we don't find that many. And so the suspicion is that this breakup process might actually be the dominant way in which the comets uh, die. So this might be the number one destructive process um, that's removing comets from the inner solar system. And if that's the case, we'd like to know how does that work? So people have different ideas. One idea is tidal. If a comet comes near to a planet or the sun, the gravity of the planet or the gravity of the sun could rip it to shreds. So there's this tidal disruption hypothesis. We know that that's totally irrelevant for Comet Atlas because it hasn't been near the sun yet and it hasn't been near a planet. It came in at 45 degrees to the solar system. So we can forget that one. Um, people always say, well, maybe it hit something. And maybe it did, but that's very, very unlikely because space is just so incredibly empty. The probability that a comet is going to hit something big enough to break it up is, is really kind of tiny. So it's very unlikely to be due to an impact. And in addition, when you look at those fragments, the fragments themselves are also breaking up. And presumably they're not being hit you know, independently by other bodies as they come through. So the first two explanations probably not that good. Maybe there's some kind of an explosion. Like maybe there's like super volatile ice. You mentioned carbon monoxide. Maybe there's a lot of carbon monoxide that gets heated by the sun and makes a pocket of high pressure gas and the thing blows up like a hand grenade. But 
that seems doubtful to me as well, because to make a hand grenade, you need a strong steel shell, right? You explode the um, material inside the shell, and then uh, the pressure builds up until the uh, hand grenade uh, frag fragments and creates shrapnel. But a comet is not strong like that. We know that comets are made of very, very weak uh, material, almost like talcum powder. So it's hard to imagine how you could build up a bomb out of talcum powder. And so the last one is my favorite, um, which is rotational instability. And that is the comet um, spins itself up faster and faster and faster until it just blows itself apart. Its, it's centri centrifugal acceleration becomes bigger than gravity and it literally spins itself apart. So, you know, I can't say which one is correct. Maybe there are other ideas too, um, but my, my bet would be on the last one. So I just have a couple of pictures. I'll, I'll zip through, the, through those. Here's, um, here's one that we know was a tidal disruption. That's the famous Shoemaker-Levy 9 that was pulled apart by Jupiter um, back in like 1993, something like that. Here's a comet that um, I did get to observe with HST in 2016, um, the, the very not famous 332P Ikea Murakami. <laughs> um, and I hope you can see the movie. Do you see it moving? Um, no? Yes. Oh, you do? OK. Yep. So I, these are images from three nights, 26, 27, 28 January. I registered them on the bright thing, which is the parent of all the other things. And you can see all the other objects are moving away from it at a speed that actually increases with the distance. It's a bit like Hubble's law. Uh, and so this is a cloud of fragments released from this body and moving off at this speed, which is like uh, less than a meter per second. So I think that Atlas, if we had more, more nights or more orbits of data, would show this kind of motion. Um, and there's a close up, just I, these are the pieces that I was able to measure in that comment. So there's a lot of stuff. There's like a lot of bits to look at. Um, here's one from a while ago, again, with uh, Space Telescope. This is uh, 1999 S4. This is a long period Oort cloud comet that uh, fragmented and made this big uh, cloud of dust pushed back by radiation pressure from the sun. Um, here's a very, very pretty picture of uh, the, the even more annoyingly named 73P Swashman Washman. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm pleased I could say that. Uh, you can see all the pieces there. And the, these, li these literally are, you know, tiny fragments. They're probably five meters across and 10 meters across. So, you know, like the size of, um, size of your house or smaller, um, all resulting from that, uh, that body at the head. Here's a, um, a picture of, of what can happen in an extreme circumstance. So this is a picture by uh, a very good amateur astronomer, Ernesto Guido and his colleagues, uh, who actually puts really nice pictures on the web of many interesting comets. Uh, and you can see he's taken two, two pictures here showing basically this fuzzy thing, like where's the nucleus in that, in that picture? There's no bright point. There's just a bunch of stars and things in the background, but the comet now is just a just a cloud of, of debris. The whole thing is basically disintegrated into pieces that are individually too small to be seen. And we don't honestly know how that happens, but it does happen sometimes. Um, and then just because it's always good to look at freaks, uh, <laughs> here, here is an asteroid. This is not a comet. It's an asteroid called 2013 R3. Its orbit is right there in the asteroid belt. If I showed you the orbit, you would never pick this out from any other asteroid. You could not, because its orbit is the orbit of an asteroid. But what does it look like? Well, it looks like a fragmented comet. So this, whatever this process is that can fragment um, a comet nucleus, it can do it also to asteroids. So I thought this is a, a very excellent object. Um, so uh, before you move to your last picture there, may I ask, speaking of asteroids, would you, do you think um, Oumuamua is an asteroid or, uh, you yeah. know, maybe I'll just, and I'm going to uh, put you on spot on this question because it's a tough one. One of the things that was kind of um, fascinating for people was that Oumuamua changed its orbit as it swung through. 
Right. So there was some acceleration of some sort, which made some people say, oh, well, they turned down their warp engines or their, their right. thrusters, and it's, a, it's clearly a spaceship. Yep. So what caused, I mean, is it a comet? Did it outgas? Was, well, I mean, it's either an asteroid or a comet or a spaceship. So, you know, the, the really cool one, of course, is the, space, the spaceship. I would love it to be a spaceship. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we would need much more evidence to argue that it's um, uh, a spaceship. Can so, you explain the acceleration through natural causes? Yeah, maybe. So the the... It's called not. They call it non-gravitational acceleration. So it's it's change. It's changing its position. It's accelerating a little bit differently from what is caused by the sun alone, and that's a general feature of comets. And it's caused by what's called the rocket effect. So the stuff that comes off the comet nucleus mostly leaves the day side because the day side is the hot side. That's where the ice is vaporized, and it goes whoosh off towards the sun. And so that, uh, by Newton's law, uh, exerts a push in the opposite direction, like a rocket, like the gas coming out of the nozzle of a rocket. So that rocket effect could explain uh, Oumuamua. The trouble is, we don't see any stuff coming out of that object. I mean, people, I look very hard, other people look very, very hard. We don't see any material coming out. So that's weird. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that the only thing that came out was gas. And the kinds of pictures that I've been showing you are not sensitive to gas. They, they are most sensitive to dust. So uh, it's possible that for some reason, Oumuamua emitted pure gas. But why would it be like that? That's kind of a weird, you know, made up explanation. It's possible, but that's possible. That that's, seems unlikely. And there another was a... idea, another branch of idea that's, that's been talked about by several groups now is that actually the um, the structure of Oumuamua is more like a sheet of mylar. You know, this um, when when people have those birthday balloons, you know, happy birthday and uh, uh, have a lovely birthday, that kind of, the, the, the aluminized mylar is um, very thin material and very reflective. If you had a piece of mylar uh, in sunlight, it would feel a pressure from the sunlight and that would give it a non-gravitational acceleration. So people began to talk about Oumuamua as being a very, very thin, uh, low density object. Maybe it's not a sheet of mylar, that would have to be alien mylar, <laughs> but um, maybe it's a very low density kind of honeycomb, fractal, porous nucleus. And there are a bunch of papers saying that, hey, we think we can explain everything if the nucleus has a density of maybe um, a thousand times less than the density of water. In other words, that's the density of air. So that would have to be a remarkable thing in itself to be such a low, low density and to have survived in interstellar space, maybe for hundreds, millions or billions of years. That would be a strange thing. So there's several possible explanations for the non-grav on Oumuamua, but there's no clear answer for that. So it remains a mystery. It's very interesting. There was a paper not too long ago of a group that included Doug Lynn that said that you could model it and understand the shape and and even some of these characteristics of Oumuamua if it was a planet that had gotten too close to a star and ripped it apart into shards and you got these long sort of yeah. tensile strength in one direction and not the other um, shards of a planet. Do you think that's a good explanation or you think no, that's no, no, no. Uh, no, no, because it doesn't account for the non-gravitational acceleration at all. I mean, it may it may be a shard of something, um, but the non-grav is is totally left out of that picture. They they say a few words about that, but it's not part of their model. It's not um, something that their model really fits. So actually, for a long time, I, I assumed that the non-gravitational acceleration was was wrong. <laughs> So, you know, in, in science, the idea is basically you assume everything is wrong. You don't believe stuff. You, you believe it must be wrong somehow until you can't escape that belief. So I thought, I thought they must have messed up with the um, determination of non-gravitational acceleration. But, you know, the people who did that work are experts. And the effect is a big effect. It's not a small, subtle thing. It's a big effect. So I don't think they screwed up anymore. I think it's a real but unexplained non-gravitational acceleration. So I have no real answer about that. It's just a big mystery. On the other hand, Borisov also has 
non-gravitational acceleration. But it's no mystery because we see all the stuff coming out of Borisov. So that that's yeah. just like, like any other comet. I think that's your last picture. So tell us about it and then we'll take a couple questions. Go ahead. Well, so um, in early March, I think March, between March 6 and 9, something like that, um, a Polish group led by uh, Mike Drahus, who used to be my postdoc at UCLA, uh, noticed that the object was brightening. So it brightened by 0.7 of a magnitude, which is like a factor of two or something. And as I mentioned earlier, often when a comet brightens unexpectedly like that, it means maybe it broke up. So, so people were like, well, maybe something good's gonna happen. It's gonna, it's gonna fall, in, fall apart in front of our eyes. But there was no further development. Now, I, I have had this program with my colleagues to image uh, Borisov with the Space Telescope. So we get the highest resolution you can possibly get. Um, and we did see a, a double nucleus, actually, in um, March the 30th, so one, about one month ago, suggesting that the nucleus indeed had split. So this Drahus brightening thing, yeah, maybe the nucleus split. So here's a picture that summarizes that. <clears throat> there are different dates. I didn't have time to put the dates on the, the pictures, but they start in January and they go to April. And what you notice maybe is the one in the middle looks like a peanut. The other ones are all round, but we've got this cosmic peanut thing in the middle the picture. So it looks like the nucleus is split in two. And again, I assumed something was wrong. The space telescope pointing was bad or went out of focus or something, I don't know. Um, but no, it's a good image. Uh, and it really had that appearance on that day, but not um, four days later uh, and not seven days before. Those are the adjacent pictures. So it's a short lived uh, phenomenon in Borisov that made it look like a double object for a little while. And the tendency when you see a picture like that is to think, well, the nucleus must have broken in two. And the whole language of split comets gives you this feeling that, oh yeah, split comet, it broke into two pieces or fragmented comet, it broke into three big pieces or something. But actually um, there's no close correlation between how bright a piece is and how massive is the thing causing that brightness because we're only looking at dust. So what it means is there's comparable amounts of dust in those two things, those two ends of the peanut. Um, but one of them has the real nucleus in it and the other one has a tiny object and it's probably a few meters or something like that across. So it's a piece came off the nucleus. Um, and then that piece only survived for a few days because in the next picture to the right, it's gone. <coughs> So I wouldn't call it a breakup. I mean, the nucleus ejected a thing. Um, a photon the, torpedo the, maybe, or? What's that? Photon torpedo perhaps, or a shell. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> but I'm, 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 alien, I'm, so I'm not going to go on record yeah. with that at this time. But it, no. <laughs> so, so again, you know, we don't know why it did that, but that rotational hypothesis is a nice one because we know the Borisov is small. It's only it's less than 500 meters in radius, probably 400 meters in radius, and we know that small comets like that can change their spin when they're losing mass quite quickly. And so it's entirely plausible that the Borisov nucleus is rotating quickly and a boulder dropped off the surface yeah. because of that. So that could be a very mundane explanation of what we see in that peanut picture. Great. And while we go over to questions, I know we have two. I've got to ask, is anybody else thinking no more rhymes than I mean it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I'm glad you got the reference. Uh -huh. <laughs> I have a, a couple of comments and one question, if I may. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, the people who observe comets carefully, even in the amateur world, are rather small in numbers. And uh, I, I covered comets a lot for our Griffith Observer magazine. And I remember you, your colleague, uh, Quan Ji, uh, when he was in high school, because he had a blog in Shanghai of his comet observations. And he was one of the few places on the internet where you could find comet information from amateurs. And um, also I remember you because uh, I, I also covered the hunt for Halley's Comet starting in 1980. And you were mm -hmm. on the team at Palomar that made the first image of Halley's Comet in 1982, back when, say, ragtimes were popular. I mean, back 
the first time it was seen since ragtimes were pop popular early in the uh, in the twentieth century. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> a lot's changed musically, but yeah, those were pretty popular tunes in their day. Um, thanks a for hint there, for Tony. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brendan. Oh, David. I have a question. Um, have you revised the estimate of the number of interstellar objects in the solar system? Last time you told it was ten thousand. Now we've seen two. What's our new number? It's about the same. About so, the same. That's cool because because our we love telling this to our visitors because it's kind of mind blowing to think there's that many of them. So that's I thought that excellent. was the most that to me that was the most interesting thing. Actually, yeah. the, the population has got to be huge because we're so bad at detecting these small, fast objects going by the Earth. You know, there has to be a huge number for us to have a chance of seeing even the first one. That was the the essence of that argument. Mm -hmm. And let me be the first to say I was also lucky, <laughs> lucky to get the right answer. <laughs> but um, other people have done that calculation in more detail. I just did it on a piece of paper and they did it in detail and they get the same answer. Uh, and it's it's fully confirmed by Borisov. But, you know, we'll learn more as we find more objects. So when we get, um, certainly when we get the LSST, which is this big um, survey telescope that's going to be doing the whole sky every couple of nights, that should find a lot of these things. But Borisov was not a big survey telescope guy. He had his own backyard telescope, basically. And so there's a real chance that now, now our eyes and our minds are open to this kind of object. There's a real chance that we can uh, find more uh, just by people going out into the back and having a look. So Brendan, we have a couple of questions from our audience and then we'll move on. We do, we do, and I'll try to get through them quickly. Um, so Lisa on live stream asks, uh, what causes the ice in comet nuclei to form? So stepping back a little ways in the conversation. Yeah, so that, that's a good one too. It goes right back to the origin of this, the planetary systems. So, you know, the Borisov and Oumuamua are from a different planetary system, but the idea is probably the same. So um, as Laura mentioned, the solar system starts out as kind of a disk. And there's a particular distance in that disk called the snow line, um, inside which water can only exist as steam, essentially, and outside which it can only exist as ice. So all the objects that formed inside that snow line uh, tend to be rocky uh, because there's no ice for them to trap. It's only steam, it's a gas, and it's harder to trap. Whereas objects outside that snow line are cold because they're further away from the central star, and that's where the ice is. And so when you build a body, you've got ice and rock and dust and stuff mixed together. So the objects are intrinsically icy if they form beyond the snow line. It's like when you go up a mountain, if you go up, like you wait the winter time in Southern California, for example, and you look over to the mountains, if, <laughs> if the smog allows you to see the mountains, you can see there's a snow line. There's a definite line above which there's snow and below which there isn't. And that's because the temperature is dropping as you go up the mountain. And you reach a point where suddenly the water just has to be frozen because it's so cold. Well, it's like that when you go away from the sun. You reach a point where the water just has to be frozen because it's so cold. And in our solar system, that distance is something like three, three and a half times the Earth-Sun distance. So I think what it means is the comets formed f uh, further away from the sun than that. And that's not a big surprise because Kuiper Belt is 40, 40 times the Earth-Sun distance and the comets in the Oort cloud uh, formed somewhere between Jupiter and Neptune, so somewhere between five times the Earth-Sun distance and, and 30 times the Earth-Sun distance. So they've just, they just formed far away and so they automatically incorporate ice. Great. And was there another one, Brendan? There we... were uh, there were two more. Uh, so Lisa also asked, uh, could asteroids be formed by comets breaking apart? So something like uh, Comet Atlas, when it breaks apart, could we see those turn into asteroids? Well, I think so, in principle. So that, that comes back to the idea of you know, where do the comets go? <clears throat> so if a comet dies simply by losing its ice, if it just gets warmed by the sun and the ice just, just goes away, then the thing you've got left behind is rocky. And then to all the, essentially to all of the observational techniques that we have, um, it would look like an asteroid. So we'd say, oh, it's an asteroid. It might be moving in a comet-like orbit, uh, but it would have an asteroidal appearance. So the basic answer is yes. And there are some objects indeed in the solar system that move 
with the orbits of comets, so these very elliptical, you know, long, skinny, sometimes highly inclined orbits, uh, but don't show any activity at all. And so those are candidates for being essentially dead comets. So yeah, that can happen. Great. And is and the last one a quick one, Brendan? Our final question, uh, it could be, uh, hopefully it will be. Um, so uh, with Atlas being kind of a dud, when can we expect uh, to see the next visible comet? Perhaps the, the kind of the wrap up of the comet discussion. Who, who said Atlas is a dud? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, that was me. That is me uh, putting Editor my own editorial spin idea. on it for flavor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the question was, what? Well, when's the next one? When? Uh, yes, when's the next like visible one for for those spectators on Earth? I have no idea. I honestly don't know. Does anybody else know? News, news for you later in the show. Okay. Cool. Ooh, there's a tease. Well, Dave, we are extremely grateful uh, that you chose to spend your Friday evening with us. I know we all have uh, places to go, people to see. So we're so happy that you uh, spent that time with us. Okay, and, Glad to be here. Uh, you know you're welcome to stay, uh, but I know you probably got to get back to your next proposal, and you know chime in anytime you like. We're we're always happy to have you join us. Okay, it's always a pleasure to see you. Well, thanks for asking me. All right, yep. thank you. Bye bye. Bye.